Yes, good evening everybody. Um, photography, live and uncut. I've changed the name of the program slightly because even I found it a little bit hard to find uh, from time to time, so I've introduced photography, live and uncut. Um, great pleasure to introduce my guest today. He's been podcasting for quite a number of uh, shows. I'm going to find out in a second how many he's done. It's John Arnold. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you very much. And it's uh, I've been going since 2006. I started in 2006. I've done over 200 shows. Over 200. Well, last week, as everyone knows, and you do as well, I was talking to Brooks Jensen, who is the granddaddy of them all, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, he's my hero. He's my a absolute hero. Me too. He's approaching 900 shows. I can't believe it. I think he's 30 away from 900 shows. Yeah. And he was he's a machine and an amazing photographer. He is, indeed. Uh, I was totally amazed with uh, his total whole setup of what he does with Lenswick Online is just... The forethought that he puts into his business is truly amazing. But anyway, that was last week. This week it's your your uh, your show, John Arnold. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to feel, sounds as I'm going to say this is your life, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's interesting actually. We've got a couple of uh, a couple of parallels going on here because I noticed that you your first camera was the Instamatic 110, which, as it turned out, was my first camera. Ha oh yes, um, I love was that. Given camera. to you, or did you buy it yourself? Oh no! It was it was bought for me by my parents, um, and I, I I remember taking it uh, on all the holidays. It was mostly holidays I took pictures on, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was uh, you know they were they were they were unusual places that, that so you could find some some angles and some views that you would never see at home. And you know we all do this. We always love to go somewhere new because yeah. we see the world afresh. And having a camera with you when you're doing that is a wonderful thing. Yeah, uh, but true. the thing the thing I loved about all those photographs, and I've still got some of them was uh, I would put them all in albums and then I would stick stickers all over the albums right. uh, or, you know, on, on the, the plastic cover in front of the photograph. So I feel like if I was ever to scan them in, I, I would have to scan them with the stickers on because that was, that was how I displayed them at the time. That's your record, isn't it? What, what, yeah. camera, followed, what camera followed the, uh, the 110 then? Uh, did you get by a DSL, uh, an SLR? Uh, no, uh, when, once I... Once I uh, once I sort of grew out of that, I started borrowing my dad's. He had a, a Pentax ME Super, um, and I did use that for a while. But then school and university, and uh, that all that all dropped um, until much later, really. Um, yeah. And I think I probably got my first digital around about 2000. Yeah. Um, and there was a big gulf in between. Uh, just towards the end of that gulf, um, I did buy a Canon EOS 300 uh, film camera. And it was just before digital hit, and I took a load of pictures with it. But I remember at the time being very frustrated, because you know I would take pictures, and there would be this massive long gap between when I took the picture and when I saw the picture, and I, I wasn't progressing, and I and I wasn't getting photographs that I loved, um, and, and that was, and and I, there was a, there was a there was a clear watershed for me because I was using this camera, um, and I wasn't liking the results, and I thought to myself, do I want to try and get better at this? Um, or do I just want to give up? Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know, eventually I decided right. I'm gonna I'm gonna invest in a small um, compact digital camera. I think it was like a Canon S something, oh. an S30 or something like that. Um, and and so I I I flopped onto the onto the okay. Let's see if I can get better at this approach. And I remember at the time thinking it was a lot of money, and I wasn't sure whether or not it was going to be something that I was really going to get into. And um, and I and I did it, and immediately, of course, you get that fantastic yeah. feedback cycle where you're able to see the picture straight away, and and yeah. and, and everything grew from there. But yeah, yeah there was there was a, there was a decision moment. I remember it. Yeah. So. Really, here you're you're working now. You're in an in the IT industry. Um, not, not so much IT anymore, but yeah, I was for a very long well, time. That's what yeah. I'm saying. So your 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 interest in photography is really just a personal thing. But because mm. this digital camera came along, it started to dare I say use the term eat away at you and sort of <laughs> wormed its way into my brain. Yeah. My, yeah, <laughs> its way into you. So um, when you uh, when you got the uh, the camera, you got you've obviously got that immediate. What did you do then? Because I'm trying to think back. 2000, Photoshop obviously was around because it was huge in the printing industry. Mm. Um, what what were you using then to to uh, edit your your photographs at home? Uh, well, at the time, I had just left my first job, which I, I, I worked for years and years at a company called ICL. Anyone, props to anyone who knows what ICL is. Um, 
but uh, it was the, the British computer uh, computer industry. It was the IBM equivalent of, in in the UK, and they. Um, uh, I, I left there because it, it was clearly going downhill, and I went to a job where I was a web designer. Actually, I was my my job title was web god, um, and my my first my first duty as web god was to hire web boy, because um, they wanted a team of people in house that could do all of their uh, internet stuff. So I was I was already at that point running a part time business as a web designer, mm -hmm. as, as a web programmer, and that was the phase where I learned all about design and typography and color theory because um, there's a whole story uh, where a friend of mine said to me um, that, that I would never be able to be a proper artist because I was a science guy and you couldn't be both and everyone knew that uh -huh. and actually that kind of played into what I'd been led to believe at school as well um, and I'm kind of fundamentally very arrogant and I decided that I wasn't going to accept that and I was going to learn and I figured at the very least I could do a professional job if not if not a proper proper art maybe I could do something that was actually you know decent design decent uh, decent typography and graphics and color and all those things that, that go towards making assembling an image that is pleasing um, so I studied and I just learned and learned and, and that led me into the into website design and that led me into that job at, uh, as a as web guard. Uh, and at that point, I got access to Photoshop, and that kind of started the ball rolling on the post-processing side, which has become so important to my photography. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is all pre-Lightroom, pre-Aperture. Oh, yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. cracking. Way, around way, about eight yeah. or nine years, uh, ten years before, isn't it? Photoshop 3. Not CS3. Photoshop 3, right. Photoshop not 3. No, exactly, not <laughs> CS3. I do remember yeah. Photoshop 3, because around about this sort of time, I, would, I was just uh, in the print industry uh, selling leaflet uh, for inserts into magazines and I used to go up into the, uh, the, the room there and sort of see what the guys are doing with the images and they'd be spot checking and that sort of stuff and they were using Photoshop to do that, to do that spot checking uh, which was uh, to me just amazing just to watch it and see how people could do it in those days. It was the first but, version uh, of Photoshop that had layers that was. Was it really? I, believe it or not. I, I had no idea until much, much later. It was the first one with yeah. layers. It, it, it changed the world, basically. And then for me, I was, I don't know, do you remember Quark Express? Oh, yes. Quark Express, and then obviously. <laughs> They're not happy memories. <laughs> <laughs> and it all went on from there. Do you remember, do you remember Tech? Do you no, remember Tech I, before? I don't remember that one. Tech no. and Late. Oh, yeah. No, I don't remember. I, I remember, <laughs> obviously, the plates going through, doing the, well, the film and the plate. That was. Uh, they're all cracking me. That's going back now, is it? That's all old hat stuff. So let's uh, let's talk about your photography. <laughs> it's become the old double show. Yes, yeah, the old timers. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's talk about your photography. So really, I get the impression that uh, you just enjoy taking photographs. There's no particular one genre like myself in, really into street photography. You like to mm. you you cover all. I, um, to me, photography is a way of turning on the other half of my brain. Um, mm -hmm. I am fundamentally, as 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 a person, I am kind of geeky. You know, I'm a programmer, and I and I'm interested in gadgets, and I'm and I love science and maths, and I teach programming as well as as well as photography. Um, and I just I just want both half of my brain, both halves of my brain functioning. So to me. Uh, as much as I can stimulate myself um, in, in that other half of my brain, uh, the, the better. So I, I try and do a little of everything. It's, it's partly because I now teach photography, because I feel like I'd like to be able to teach as much of photography as I can. But it is just, just generally that, that, I, that I love every aspect of it. I, there's something that, that, is, that is enjoyable about taking on a new, a new discipline. Yeah, I, I I do agree with you there because I think sometimes if you do stick to one discipline all the time, um, I think you do need to sort of get out of that band, so to speak, and try something else. For instance, take mm. me for and say do some landscape photography or maybe some macro work just for just to, to break down. I don't want to use the word monotony, but I think sometimes people do get into that rut of doing the same sort of work. Those people that those people that get caught in one rut, it's not monotony to them. They no. they love what they do and they yeah. and they work at it and work at it and they refine and refine and refine and polish and polish, and that's right. great. And I you know and I have huge admiration for those that that do that. Right. But it's just not me. I I I, I am scatterbrained. I am you know, slightly ADD, if you like, and, and I can't just do one thing constantly. I, I will laser focus on one thing, and I work really hard on it, 
and then I'll jump and I'll do something else and laser focus on that and work really hard on it. Yeah. And you know, and I, I, I just try and make sure that when I do leave one discipline, I've got enough left in my brain that I can that I can go back to it, remember what I've learned, you know, reuse it. Right. So it's just constant education, really, it's constant self-education, really. Yeah. So from your photography, then you decided that uh, you wanted to get more into teaching, uh, teaching what you were learning yourself in photography and your editing, and you created uh, photo photo walkthrough. How did yeah. how did that idea come about? And it was. Um... I was taking part. Have you spoken to Chris Marquardt? Who I've, runs, no, uh, I haven't spoken to him, but obviously, I was just seeing show. If you get him on the show, he is a fascinating and entertaining guy. Um, mm -hmm. And I credit him almost entirely mm -hmm. with the start of my career as a as as a, a photography educator, because he ran a, a a podcast called Tips from the Top Floor, which he's still doing. It's a great yeah. show. Tips from the Top Floor dot com. Hi, Chris. You can thank me later. Um, <laughs> And he ran a, a forum to go with the show. I was to listen to the show. I got involved in the forum. I posted a picture that I'd worked on as part of a competition. I don't normally do competitions, but it happens at that time I was. Um, and people liked it. It didn't win or anything. You know, it just came like fifth or something like that, third or fifth, I don't remember. But people said, how did you do it? So I tried writing it down. I tried doing it with screenshots and text. And my goodness me, that was yeah, that's looking hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, this is not my medium. Yeah. Um, so I uh, I tried screen recording it, um, and that worked out great. It was about five hours long, uh -huh. <laughs> and I used a whole bunch of tools that no longer exist now because it was so long ago. Um, but yeah, I, I showed step by step how I did it, and, and people seemed to like it, so I made another one on a different image, and then I made another one, and eventually I thought, I should put a website together for these to go on, and it was photo walkthrough. Um, and since then, I've done. I, I, since then, I've had two small children, so that's made it difficult to keep producing. But you know, it, the, the pace has slowed down, but I think the quality has greatly improved. Um, so your style of uh, creating photo walkthrough is is unlike this, which is basically live and uncut and straight recorded. I don't do any editing mm. uh, for for the uh, the YouTube version. So you, in actual fact, are recording this at home in your studio there, and then yep. then you're posting it to YouTube from then on. That's right. I I record. I I do a lot of prep uh -huh. because I like to make sure that when I do a do a do a demo. Yeah. Um, I know which direction I'm going. I don't. I don't just turn on the turn on the, the screen and uh, and start editing and hope that it goes in a good direction. I, I've usually done it before and know what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. and, and now when I do webinars, I do the same thing. I, I've got notes so that if I do get stuck and if I do get lost, I don't often refer to the notes. But if if I do ever get stuck, I've got them on a screen just over there, yeah. <laughs> two screens, uh, and on the other screen I keep Evernote running with all my with all my editing plans on, so I can see. Where where to go to if I do get stuck or if it's or if it's looking looking bad, um, but no, I do a lot of preparation and then I, and then I record live and I try and do it in one take and usually I succeed. Yeah. But, but yeah, there is a bit of editing and there is a bit of prep. And I, I used to work incredibly hard to get the shows uh, intricate with ads in them and and trying to get a lot of in, interaction with the audience and. But that took so long. It was such a lot of work. Yeah. You, know, you don't realize how much work video is until you try and produce a show with. You know, with all those moving parts. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so now, I like, keep it much simpler now, and I love this hangout approach. It's fantastic. Well, the, the hangout really has obviously just opened up uh, uh, so many different avenues for obviously so many different people, and that's one of the main reasons why I I didn't get involved with the uh, the recording of a show because of the editing process, the possibility of adding ad advertisements in, into it as well. I just could see that as a as a, a, a hassle for me, especially as I'm, I'm I've got a normal nine to five working. Well, I say nine to five; it's a little bit longer than that, but you know. So uh, have I. <laughs> so have I. <laughs> so you, uh, you, it's difficult to uh, to sort of set that time aside to do it. Fo photo walkthrough, though, uh, John, isn't just about editing photographs, is it? You uh, you do no. get involved with anything that uh, interests you. The the idea behind photo walkthrough, I didn't I didn't want to do Scott Kel Scott Kelby Mark two. The truth is Scott Kelby is great at what he does. Yeah. Um, and you know there's no point trying to take him on at that game because he, he's he's really good. He's really entertaining. He teaches technique beautifully well. Yeah. Um. So I thought well I'm not going to try that approach because for for starters it didn't interest me so much because I, I as I said the whole purpose of this to me was to activate the artistic half of my brain. Uh -huh. Um. And so. 
uh, I've always said photography is 50% science, 50% art. Um, and I'm very comfortable with the science part. And I think most of us that come to photography as geeks are. We're very comfortable with the gadgets and the buttons and the techniques and stuff. And, and it's useful being able to follow along with a, with a technique you know, on, on YouTube or something. But what I want to teach is the other half. I want to teach um, why you use a technique as well as how. I mean, I, I'm going to show you the technique. But I'm also going to talk about why it's the right technique. I'm going to teach you how to look at a photograph and decide what, what to do to it. Without just without just running through presets and without going, uh, you know, to trying to take an approach that is discovery. Uh, I want you to try and look at a picture, and analyze it, and pre-visualize what you're going to do in the post-processing stage yeah. before you start, because then you've got a direction. Then you know where you're heading at, and you can <laughs> say, I'm, "Is what I'm doing to this image moving it in the direction I had in mind?" Um, and it, uh, that 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 pre-visualization idea, and I, I hate to use the phrase because it's, you know, it's been so overused. Um, yeah. Uh, Ansel Adams came up with it, didn't he? But, yes, uh, that's right. Uh, but it, that's essentially what I'm talking about. I, I just want to make sure that people have a have an end goal in mind when they start post processing, because that that way lies your own uh, your own style. That way you discover what you like. That way you discover what your what your personal joyful image looks like, mm. and, and you will end up with a style that is recognisable by doing that. Yes, but it takes a long time of of, of Watching a lot of art, critiquing a lot of art, um, deciding what you like, what, deciding what you don't like, and and actually visual, visual verbalizing that is what makes it um, yeah. crystallize in your brain. Yeah, uh, creating your style doesn't happen overnight, does it? It's something no. that you have to have to work at, and uh, whether it's through camera or whether it's as you say, editing process. Um, after all, I've always said this many times of the fact in the old the old days, the old time of photo photographers, well, not so long ago really, David Bailey's and, and the Patrick Litchfields and those sort of guys that were doing the work which in the 60s and 70s, they just took the photograph. They, they, a lot of their work was being done in the in the darkroom by the guys that knew the darkroom process. Mm. Very few photographers did both both sides. It's, it's different now where we're in a position, we've got the tools where we can manipulate the image accordingly to what we want want people to see. Yeah, and actually, I think there's two great things have, have come as a result of that. Uh, for a start, we we are now able to to have uh, complete control over this process. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's also um, it's raised the level of everybody's photography to such a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've been I've been teaching photography, uh, and it started out with just you know making videos, but it's grown into a whole raft of other other educational stuff stuff as well. But um, I've been teaching photography since sort of starting in 2006, beginning of 2006, and even in those uh, eight years, the the level of the standard of, of photography has risen so dramatically. Yeah, uh, and I believe it's because people now do have that control over the entire process, and, and the tools are getting better. Um, you know, it, it started off with Photoshop, which was a very basic tool, actually. Uh, I mean, granted, it's it's incredibly capable, but it's really hard to get the best out of it. Yeah, and you know, the next thing you know, uh, the various plugins came along. You know, notably the Nick stuff was really, really good, and it started to treat you more like an artist than it did a t than a, an engineer. Um, and that the sliders worked in a way that sort of, you know, were, it, there wasn't really any way you could put the slider on the dial that didn't look good. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and that isn't true in Photoshop. You know, you'll know this. If yeah. you, there are places you can drag the slider in Photoshop that's going to make the photo look terrible. Um, and <laughs> but, yeah. but so th there's a lot of tools that are just getting better and better and better, and, and people have are, got better tools available. And because the tools now support you so much, People can focus on the image. They can focus on the quality. They can focus on the art, and yeah. that's what we're in it for. Yeah, and I think also another thing which has come about actually, John, is the fact because we've got the the the, the open internet now with the likes of Google Plus and and Facebook and Flickr. People now can see so much different art being created by so many photographers. We don't have to rely on the printed version anymore, the magazine which comes out, or maybe the book which we want to go out and purchase. Because it's there on the screen for us every minute of the day. That's right. Just just open up the homepage of 500px.com. Exactly right. And you know, uh, of all the sites, of all the photography sites out there, that is the one that regularly surfaces the most amazing artwork. Um, yeah. 
inspiring stuff. And I, you know, if ever I'm if ever I'm bored and I've got a few minutes, that's where I go. I just I just yeah. go under pics and look at a few people's stuff. Put it on there and let the slideshow do the work for you, and it's yeah. uh, and away it goes. It's, it's that is an amazing site. You're quite right. Yeah. Um, this 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 teaching angle that you you got yourself into, John, interests me because it's not just photo walkthrough. You're now teaching in schools. You're now you do your you do still go to the clubs and, and make your presentations. I understand. Not not so much anymore. I did oh, okay. start doing some club presentations. Um, there's there's a group that I work with that, that is not really a camera club um, that puts on workshops and things you know, in the north northwest of Wales called Wellshot. They put on uh, training sessions. But the reason I like them is uh, we we were talking before the show. Um, mm -hmm. Clubs can be a little bit secretive. The people yeah. in clubs can be. Uh, a little bit closed-lipped about how they do things, and there is a competition element to it. Um, and what Welsh have done that's for the, 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 that I, uh, I, I, I don't want to make this an ad for those guys because as great as they are, you know, this is about me. Um, <laughs> but um, but the the key thing they did that's very clever is they kept away from the competition side of things, and they kept away from. Uh, the pride and uh, you know letting any one person become too much of a star, yeah. Uh, because you always find in clubs there's always somebody who, who is like the leading light, uh, uh -huh. and I just think it it is destructive to everyone else. It's great if you're the guy that's the leading light, but but everybody else is going to feel like they're in your shade all the time. And I think that's yeah. that's not what photography should be. It should be something that people are able to do for joy, show their work, and and feel proud of. Uh, and never have to say, oh, but it's not as good as Fred's, you know, and uh, uh, that that undermines the whole thing. And that's why I stopped yeah. doing the competitions. That's interesting you mentioned that because uh, I noticed on Facebook a couple of days ago someone had made a comment about how they were feeling down about their work, how Joe Blogs was always producing better work than them, and I just had to blog it. I get, I do get fed up with this attitude by some people that they don't think their work is good enough, and I likened it to how many times do you hear a sportsman say that he played badly. They never mm. say that. They always say, yeah, I played well, but I can play better next time. Be it a footballer, a cricketer, a golfer in particular, because they play on the psychology so much. But uh, no, you're right. And, and in the, with the camera club, yes, you always do get one. Uh, as in my case, my last club that I was a member of, there were four top quality photographers. And quite rightly so, they were winning everything. And it does put everybody else in a sort of a second league basis. And it's it's very difficult to uh, to break that uh, that mold and uh, and sort of share what I think you do mm. and have said you you do it, it is your the, the the way that you're prepared to share your knowledge as a teacher. You know what the, my my favourite thing would be uh, if somebody comes along and and. Uh, and races past me and becomes an amazing photographer and does fantastically well. This is not a competition. You know, I love what I do and I enjoy my pictures. But I'm not the best photographer in the world. I'm not the greatest out there. I'm not going to tell you that every photo I take is is going to look, you know, wonderful. Hmm. Um, the, I take tons of really crappy pictures. Um, the trick is not showing them. <laughs> the problem if you're teaching photography like I do, because quite often you have to show you crappy pictures. But anyway, so. Yeah. I, undermine myself there a bit. But yeah, I, I think it just it should be for fun, it should be for joy. Mm. Um, and if somebody gets so good at it, they get so much joy out of it that they become an amazing photographer, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. I would love it yeah. if the people that join my cohort in the Arcanum all surpass me. That would be brill. I would be so proud. Exactly right. And that's that's exactly the right attitude to have. Whilst on the subject of your photography you know, screen share. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! <laughs> if I can, if, if I can get the there we go. Screen share. Stand by your beds, everyone. <laughs> I'll get the drink out. You, you get the drink out. Yeah, here you go. Well, what I first noticed about the the work here is this stunning, and I mean this. I'm not saying because you're on this show. Stunning macro work that you're doing here. Thank you. These, look at these, these particular, I'm not, shall I? Yeah. I'll double click on them. Yeah, do what you like, yeah. Uh, here we go. Here we go. You had to take a guess what that was taken with. Well, now you've asked me, 
I was going to say this has got to be taken with the Canon 5D Mark II. Nope. But now you've said that, it probably isn't. Uh, can I? Did you say you had a Lumix? Uh, yeah, GX7, which I'm going to sell fairly soon. But is yeah. this what you took that with? But yeah, this was shot with the um, with the GX7. Yeah. I. I it, it, this is just where it does, and again, this is another subject which we might have time to get onto, where people decry other photographers which are not using big DSLR cameras to produce quality work. Can I ask a question? Because this is really driving me nuts. Yeah. When did when did cameras get so big? Because you know, if you look Actually, back in the days of that Pentax ME Super that I was using of my dad's, yeah. that was an SLR. Yeah. And it had interchangeable lenses. Yeah. And it was about the size of this GX7. I know. And do you know something else has just occurred to me? And I did I did blog about this a few months ago. When Nikon bought out the V1, which I got uh, got into and started saying, well, fantastic camera, superb mm. images, but it's just a little bit too small in my hand. That's the only reason I sold it. In mm. actual fact, stood it against the Nikon EM, the Nikon EM, that aperture priority camera which was bought out in the, the was it mid seventies, I think. Oh, They're yeah. exactly the same size. Yeah. Exactly the same size, and you still get guys saying they can't make a full frame camera that small. And I'm sorry, I just can't see why it doesn't work. Clearly they can. Like a Clearly they can, exactly. I think it had to do something, these bigger cameras had to do something with the fact of the battery. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I think you might be right, actually. I think batteries probably did make them get bigger. Yeah. And now if they're not big like that, you get people saying, well, it's too small for my hand. Exactly. Get, yeah. get a grip. Get a, get a battery grip. Yeah, very true. First thing, I, first thing I bought when I got the Fuji, I bought a, uh, bought a, a hand grip. Yeah. Um, just for it, just so it's more solid in my hand, so I wasn't frightened to, uh, to drop it. So back, getting, back to the picture, though. Back to the images, though. Shallow depth of field. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It's. So that was taken uh, with a, a, at the long end of a, um, a thirty-five to one hundred, which is the equivalent of a seventy-two hundred on a on a full-frame camera. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was shooting for shallow depth of field, and I was getting as close as I reasonably could, mm -hmm. and the intention was to get this this range of of uh, things in focus, and I was hoping that that um, that one or two of the prettier flowers were going to be the ones that are in focus, and it worked out nicely on the particular shot you picked. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean. The point is, you don't have to have a big old SLR to take a nice picture. Very true. Uh, as simple as that, really. Yeah. I'm going to use the term bokeh on this. It's lovely. I just love it. <laughs> as Kai from Digital Rev would say, bokeh. Bokeh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was going for. Exactly. And this, this again. Yeah. That one was great because it was one it's flower stood right up above all the others. So I was exactly. able to get that. That uh, that big difference. I just wish I hadn't caught that little bit of light on the bottom petal. Yeah, <laughs> but then again, uh, to me that 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 goes in keeping with the photograph. You've got your shadow, you've got your highlight spot. You know, it's lovely, and I like the way you use the thirds. thirds yeah. Here. Yeah, that's, that's really I think that's what position uh, technique. Yeah, uh, exactly. The thing that I loved about these flowers, and it, this was just um, it was one of those joyful moments where you can spend a bit of time on your own with a camera oh. and, and some good light because like the sun was going down and it was looking beautiful, shining through the flowers, and um, and you know it's a good hour or two away from the kids. It's great. So uh, <laughs> I uh, so I just just spent a whole load of time you know you walk past these flowers and you're like oh that looks fantastic I hope I can come back in a minute and I did and um, I, just just exploring all these different angles through all these wild flowers and just yeah. finding the little you know and imagining in your head what it would look like if you if you were to crop that to a uh, to a photo size or crop this to a photo size and just finding the, the pictures in the in the mess and the thing I wanted most of all to get was all three different stages of life Yes. If you yeah. look at all these pictures, we've got some that are in full bloom. Yeah. We've got some that are still in bud, and we've got some that are rotting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's it. And that, that was what I was trying to get in. Lovely story, actually. Lovely story. Mm. I, it, it was pure and simple. I mean, there was nothing, yeah. no art to it particularly, except just to try and capture the light and the and the colour and, and a sense of sort of the end of summer. That was really what I was trying to get to. Yeah. No. And by the way, the colours, the colours, colours are nothing like the way they really looked. No. Um, uh, remind me where this is, uh, John. Is this uh, Lisbon? 
this is uh, this is Reykjavik. Reykjavik. This is, uh, oh, of course it is. Yeah, uh, cathedral in yeah, Reykjavik. Sorry, I was looking at the looking at the statue on the left hand side here, and I thought um, I thought Columbus for some reason. No, know, yes, Lee Erikson. It's Lee yeah. Erikson's statue. So yeah, this was um, I did a, a, a workshop in uh, in Iceland and um, yeah. we did sort of five days out there. Uh, and you know, one of the days we just went round uh, Reykjavik and took a lot of pictures in the in the city oh. there. And I did love that cathedral. It's it's wonderfully modern. Is it? Yeah, it's a gorgeous place. Well worth going and and wandering around. And yeah. you can get right to the top and look out across the city. Let's move on here. Yep, that's my daughter Catherine. Catherine, the lovely, <laughs> lovely photograph of her. Again, that was with the GX7. Was it? Yeah. Uh, I think we're into 5D oh, stuff yeah, now. 5D yeah. stuff now, yeah. So I, I, I'm not sure whether that was the next one, was it? Uh, yeah, this was this. Ah, I remember now. Yes, these are focus stacking. I was playing around with. Oh, right. Okay, focus that's interesting. Stacking. Yeah. I was talking to uh, Don Komarechka a few weeks ago. I don't know if you know Don's work with uh, the sky crystals with the snowflakes. Oh yes, oh, and uh, just truly amazing work that he does. But mm. well, you wouldn't believe the size of lens that he uses for his macro shots. All <laughs> handheld as well. I was amazed. All, really? All handheld. Wow. Just literally moving the camera back and forth. He takes somewhere in between 250 to 300 images per snowflake. Wow. That dedication or what? That is that is amazing. Yeah. So this this is again this technique, is it, uh, John, using uh, the stacking? Yeah, this is for the, the, these, this little yeah. bunch here that you're going through right now. Where focus stack, yeah. and, and I, as much as anything, I was trying to just take pictures that would suit the uh, the suit the technique. So exactly, yeah. I, I'm looking at that particular shot now. I don't like the I don't like the back at all. Okay, I'll move on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that one that one I quite enjoy. Yeah, that's a nice that's image. A, that's a focus stack as well. Now this was um, uh, playing around. I, I was taking these when I just after I got the um, the GX7, and um, I was trying to see what I could do with macro, given that I didn't have a macro lens. Yeah. And so I did. I got a, um, a filter adapter that allowed me to to put on the front of the 35 100 um, a 50 mil and do that reverse 50 mil. <clears throat> So actually, this particular shot I remembered now. This one is a focus stack as well. But I think you're about to go into the ones that I, that were uh, reversed 50 mil. Yeah, here we go. This is one of them. So the lovely arty shot. I love that. Yeah, I took a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the few that was worth posting. Um, but again, color. Look, I mean, this this, yeah. this is about color. Uh, yeah, exactly right. And I just I just wanted just those few little drops of water in focus. Super. And I got endless shots of that weren't. Yeah. <laughs> Don't like that one at all. Move on. Move on. It <laughs> shouldn't be posted. Quite Do like that one. These are lovely. Lovely yeah. shots there, John. It's a good... Um, Thank you. I know, we've, I know we've concentrated more on your on your macro work there, but... Yeah, it's just because there's a whole bunch of them right yeah, now. You can it's, always, it's, always go back out and scroll down if you want to see something different. It's, it's basically... Uh, it's just to get an idea of... Uh, yeah, you, they, they, come in, they come in clumps. One of the things I like to try and do... Um, is I I know a lot of people like to leave a shot, leave a shoot with a single shot. Yeah. Uh, you know that they, they know that they've got a good shoot if they leave with one good shot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not that way. I like to I like to um, to produce collections of shots. I quite like that one that's blue and orange, by the way. There, mid middle near the bottom. I like, I like that one. Again. Um, this one here. Uh, your screen's frozen for me, so I'm not sure which one. Oh, sorry, uh, I was just trying to. Oh, I know where. I'm. Hold on. This one, yeah, that one. Um, so I, I try and I try and release groups of shots, and I like it if they've got a consistent theme about them. So you, if you look at the way I post my stuff on the photo walkthrough site, I've got, got some galleries there. Uh, not everything's on there. I've I, I just just redone the site, but um, if you look at the stuff there, it's in shoots. It's in uh, collections of images, bunched by shoot, or okay. sometimes by model. And and because I, I like to try and analyze a thing from a bunch of different angles. Yeah. So, you know all those all those early uh, summer's end photos you showed right at the beginning there. Mm -hmm. They were the idea was that they would work as a consistent set. Yeah. And there's a couple of standouts that are maybe maybe wall worthy, but there's a few others that are that are just give a different angle on the same scene that maybe give you more of a sense of place and time. Yeah. And, um, 
I, I like to work in groups of sort of uh, five to ten pictures. Yeah. I've, I've come out of the screen share because it was starting to uh, freeze up and um, it, yeah. it was, uh, that's, not, that's not fair to, to your work, but if, uh, I'm going to put these, all these I'm links I'm not precious up. about it, don't worry. I know. <laughs> that's some very good work, this. And, um, I'm going to put all the links up later on, as I always do in the blog, so I'll, I'll put 500px John Arnold up there for people to have a view because there's some some very, very good uh, examples of your work there. But I can see the way that your actual facts go about your photography in the terms that you your your willing willingness to try different styles, try different techniques, purely to add weight to your show when you're um, when you're. Yeah, I, I, I like to try and um, keep it interesting. I like to try yeah. and have something new to show people that maybe they haven't tried. And funnily enough, I did all that work on focus stacking. I never actually did a tutorial. Uh -huh. uh, at some point, I'll do a focus stacking tutorial. But the reason I didn't is that the pictures that you showed there that were focus stacked, I didn't think were quite good enough, honestly. Right. Um, I, you know, they, they were maybe good enough to post, um, but I but I didn't really feel like it was my best work. I, I feel like I've got a better focus stacks in me. So yeah. at some point, I'll go back to that. Uh, but you know the flower macros. I've done flower macros off and on, and I really love doing those. Actually, yeah, yeah. That's just something I really enjoy. Um, I think it's something which I found out when I was talking to Don Comrade. The fact that when I said to you, it takes two hundred, two hundred fifty to three hundred images per snowflake, hmm. because he, when he's stacking them, he he knows exactly where that particular image fits in to the snowflake as he's building it up, and I get the impression, in my naivety, that because he has so many. In a, of the, of that range for the stack, that's when the, the the finer detail starts coming and knitting together to make what he's in actual fact created it's just stunning work with with the snowflakes, which is just quite amazing. So, uh, mm. and I did see one guy in actual fact gave a presentation on on photo stacking once, and he used a CD marked in increments around the outside, so that as he was using the uh, the focusing. Um, what do you call the the slide there? Which uh, uh, oh, I've forgotten what it's called now. So as he in actual fact was focusing in through the image of the of the flower, he knew exactly that he was taking a different image every millimeter. Again, was stacking, getting a, a regular a regular break. Yeah, I did find while I was doing them that that was a problem. Knowing um, how far to move the move the focus each time. Yeah, you'd got all the ranges covered, and there was somewhere I, where I just hadn't got enough coverage at all, and yeah, you know, and I couldn't do the picture. And if you look at that that one that I said I like, that was sort of green and white with the with the petals sticking up. Mm -hmm. look carefully, there were some faults in that because I, there were some gaps I didn't have a decent uh, yeah a decent in focus one for. Um, I know where to look, but it, most people don't notice. No, <laughs> but there again, you see, you're you're now. I can see exactly where you're coming from here because you're now thinking through hmm. what you've done before. I'm going to have another crack at that. You've done it. You've parked a particular point of that image which you want, that type of what you're doing. You want to go back to that now, I can tell. And you yeah, want to, I do. You want, I really you do. want to do a show on it. I can. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, I've just watched your uh, Dragonized uh, oh, right. Uh, chapters of the talk about a picture that wasn't good enough. <laughs> well, it, it, it was it was great how it turned out actually, uh, because he's he's another photographer, which uh, very very uh, weird website. I must hasten to mm. add all that. And, and famously hides his technique. Yes. And you yeah. know that's why I wanted to do that video. Yeah. Because he's if he's going to hide his technique, that offends me. Yeah. I I'm not like that. I will give away everything I know. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, I've, I've I've heard this that he he will not tell people how he does it. He charges people to do that to their images. I mean, he he makes a business out of doing it for people, and that's right. fine. I, I don't want to I don't want to deprive the guy of his income. Yeah. But um, and I love his work. I mean, God, he's ah. he's got an amazing style. I love it. Yeah. But I couldn't help thinking to myself, well, it can't be that hard. I'll try and figure it out and do a video yeah. and. Because I, I mean, it was slightly, um, it was slightly Google baity because, uh, link baity. Because I know a lot of people want to do that, and I know a lot of people are interested in finding tutorials or show how to do it. I thought, well, yeah. might as well make one then. Yeah, exactly. Go for it. <laughs> but it, for it. it was at least fifty percent because he makes it a secret how he does it, and I just yeah. thought, you know, it's not cool, man. Not cool. I, I agree with you. I think photography is all about sharing, and uh, it, the guys who do it and have created their style, they're always going to be better than the others. Mm. If someone, as you said, you're quite right. If someone comes along that is better than you, 
then great, gung ho for them, let them fantastic. go. Fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Is that what it's all about? Yeah, I, I was at a um, uh, I was at a, a, a workshop with uh, Damien McGillicuddy uh, mm-hmm. last weekend or the week, weekend before. Who is who is you know he's famously got a very big ego, um, and he's a, he's a fascinating guy because uh, you know he takes wonderful photographs. He's an amazing portrait photographer, and he had people along on one of his portrait shoots, genuine genuine uh, commercial photo shoot. Uh, and he was setting the models up and, and lighting them all, and then he would take out a bunch of pictures and he'd take a lovely one, you know, and, and he'd leave with his one shot that was the winner, and he was great. And then he would let everybody else come along and shoot in the same light with the same model, with all the, everything set up the way he set it up. And I said to him at the end, I said, are you not worried the fact that, that you, you've set it all up for them, and then somebody else comes in with their camera and takes the same picture? He said, it's not the same picture. He said, if anybody leaves this workshop with a better picture than the one I took, I'll give him a thousand pounds. And you know what? I mean, it, it's arrogant, and it is an arrogant mm-hmm. thing to say, but he's right. Yeah. Nobody else took a picture as good as his. Yeah. Not me, not anybody else. Um, and the truth is, it's for two reasons. First of all, um, he's really, really good. Yeah. Uh, no questioning that. But also, he set the lights with his idea in mind. He knew what he had in mind. So mm-hmm. when he posed the model and he set the lights and he got it all set up exactly right, the picture he got on the back of the camera was based on his concept. He pre-visualized, he thought about what he wanted, he made it happen. Mm-hmm. Nobody else who walked up afterwards knew what was in his head. I mean, he tried to explain it, but it's not the same as, no. as pre-visualizing it. And, you know, he, he's, a, he's actually... A, he, he's very generous with his time and his and his and his uh, advice, and I, I recommend anyone going on one of his workshops. But you won't get any pictures as good as his, mm-hmm. but for two or three reasons. Even though not only did he give away everything he'd done, he let you use all of his setup, and it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, you just yeah. give away everything you've got, and the people that are learning from you still can't produce something that's as good as what you did because it was your thing, yeah. and they'll do they'll do their good work when it's their thing. Yes. So. Yeah, very good point. Very good point you made there. Let's talk about cameras. We touched on it while we were looking at 500px. You yeah. may, uh, uh, am I correct in saying your main camera of use would be the 5D Mark II? If I was shooting something professional that had to look good, yes. I would get the 5D Mark II out. Um, the 5D Mark III is a lovely camera, but it's way too expensive, and I don't think it was better enough, so yeah. I never upgraded. Um, 5D Mark II is a lovely camera. Yeah. A really big, really heavy Lovely camera. Oh. Um, so I take it with me only when I need it. And the rest of the time I carry this little beastie, which we've discussed already, which is yeah, a the Lumix. The Panasonic Lumix GX7. GX7, um, yeah. Which I've got the, this has got the 1235 F2A oh, no. IS on it, um, which is a nice lens. That lens I will keep. Um, the, the, the 35 100 I will keep, but I'm going to sell the camera. Um, and it's not because the camera pic- it takes bad pictures, although I, I was a little disappointed. I, I've used um, an X100 for about a year before this, mm-hmm. and I loved the X100, even though it was uh, APS-C sensor and it was you know, single 35mm lens with no zoom or anything. If you wanted mm-hmm. to get closer, you had to get closer. Um, I'm a big bloke. I don't like, I don't like walking. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... You know, but the X100 I fell in love with, and I got the Panasonic GX7, and I was a bit disappointed. It, right. The pictures aren't as good, but um, it's not, that's not the reason I'm selling it. The reason I'm selling it is that the controls are not set up for a for a photographer. They, they I'm constantly going through menus to get to things that ought to just be on a single button. Mm. I just don't get on with the interface. I, I played with a an Olympus M1, and I'm going to buy one of them instead, and I, yeah. because whenever I try and do something on the EM1, by, by and large, the button I first press is the one that does what I need it to do. Yeah. It just, it just kind of worked for me. Um, well, I'll keep these lenses, because the lenses I bought are really good. I'm really pleased with the lenses. And, and they are, they are um, standard fit for the Olympus? Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're four, uh, micro four-third four lenses. Four-third lenses, aren't so they? We perhaps ought to talk briefly about that, because um, yeah. there's two or three systems. I wanted mirrorless. I wanted yeah. something that was light enough to carry around with me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, doesn't have to go in a pocket exactly. I don't. I'd, I'd love no. to have something that is pocketable, um, and I've got the twenty mil prime for that. If I do want to pop it in my pocket, but um, no, I just wanted something that was carryable, that wasn't stupidly heavy, but took 
good enough pictures that I that if I did see something I really wanted to take and I took a picture, I would have a decent raw file that I could then go and really work on and make it, you know, make something that was that I was proud of. Mm -hmm. I think I think those those seasons and photos have proved that that is possible with Micro Four Thirds. Yeah. Um, but so I wanted a mirrorless camera, but there's two or three systems out there. There's the Fuji system that I think you've got, yeah, which are absolutely superb. I love the Fuji cameras so much; they're really, really good. Um, the reason I didn't go for Fuji was two things. First of all, the um, the sensor was a little bit larger, therefore the lenses are a little bit larger, um, and there's really only Fuji making the lenses, and um, they're, they're really good lenses, but they're not cheap. Uh -huh. Whereas Micro Four Thirds has a slightly smaller, slightly smaller sensor, uh, and it does a whole lot of in-camera stuff to correct things like distortion and stuff. So they're able to make the lenses small and light. Yeah. Um, and we are now seeing good pro quality Micro Four Thirds lenses. Olympus are about to launch another couple of those. Um, there's uh -huh. got like a 1500 uh, pound lens that they're just launching for Micro Four Thirds, and it's really good. Uh -huh. um, but uh, so there, so are good quality pro pro quality lenses coming for Micro Four Thirds. I think honestly the lenses are ahead of the bodies. I think yeah. bodies need to get a little better. Um, but they'll get there. The body the bodies are things that move on, aren't they? I mean those are the <laughs> things that, that develop and get better and better. So I I figured if I started in Micro Four Thirds, I would be able to get cheaper lenses. I'd be able to get lighter lenses. Um, and if I bought good lenses from the start, I could keep them for years and years. Yeah. And I would change the body, and the body would get better and better and better, and the lenses would already be good. And yep. uh, so that's what I'm doing. So I, I'm I'm not throwing the 5D Mark II out. The 5D Mark II still takes much better pictures, but I'm just much less likely to have it with me. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. What you say. Um, the the size wise of the Fuji didn't particularly bother me. Uh, with regards to the lenses, when I originally bought the Fuji, it was going to be one camera, one lens. But uh, I decided to get the 35mm 1.4 because of the uh, the extra stops on the, mm. the light. Nice lens. And it's a beautiful lens. Yep. Um, but yeah, I've just treated myself. With that. Oh yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. But I've just treated myself to the uh, X100S uh, on a used version, which I took out. So uh, jealous. So <laughs> jealous. <laughs> took it out last uh, last Wednesday on a night shoot along South Bank in London there, and I opened up the images a couple well, last night. I don't. I'm getting into the habit now. When I go out and shoot, I don't come home and download the images straight away. It's an idea I got from Rinsey Ruiz. He says, let the images stay where they are for the time being. Download them, then go back and edit them at a later stage. Let let your images marinate, is what he said to me. So I've been exactly. using that process. I, I agree with that, and it's not about the images marinating; it's about your brain letting go yeah. of what you thought you had. Yeah. That's exactly, yeah. If you go and look at them straight away, you don't see the image; you see your memory of the image. Yes, yeah, exactly And right. what you need to do is let your memory fade, so yeah. that you look at them with fresh eyes and see them for what they really are. Yeah. And, and he's absolutely right. It's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic tip. So, uh, so anyway, yeah. So the X100S now probably could be the one camera, one lens, which is going to be with me all the time. And my yeah. little oh, that's, talk about a cracking little camera. I know. And then my XE1 oh. will be the backup camera. So uh, there we go. Yeah. Full circle. Yeah. I should mention we, we talked about um, uh, mirrorless cameras and we talked we mentioned the Micro Four Thirds. We mentioned the Fujis, which I too I think are the two worth considering. Yep. I would like to just mention the Sony's and the, the full frame thing. Yeah. I mentioned it because Trey's going in this direction, and I don't yeah. think he's yeah. going in the right direction. I think I think the uh, A7 and the A7R are um, it's the wrong direction. Well, it's interesting you say that, and I'm going to put my two penny in. I saw and heard the A7R for the first time yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, boy, is that loud! I could hear that on the other side of the river if I wanted to. It is certainly not a street photographer's camera. Is that right? Okay, I'm not aware of that. It did well, make me laugh because size. It, it, well, it, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a reasonably sized camera now when you consider that it's a, a full frame camera. But mm. it did make me laugh because we had some guys there with the D, uh, the Nikon D sixty six ten. Sorry, we had a guy with a a six D Canon six D, a couple of other DSLRs, and I said to the guys, I said to the guy with the Sony. It was a really nice fella, don't get me wrong. I said, show the guys the shutter. So he went and went, clunk. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so just as a joke, I said, do you want to hear my shutter on my Fuji? Yeah, yeah, go on then. 
We'll do it then. So I said, I've taken three shots. <laughs> silence, total yeah. silence. Bags one hundred is just go, almost. Oh, silent. It's just, it's just lovely. But coming back to the Sony, I know exactly where you're coming from. I was very fortunate to see a presentation when the NX7 first appeared on the scene, and at the time I think they were showing the Alpha 67. I think it was, which with a translucent uh, mirror. Well, it wasn't a mirror; it's translucent. Oh yeah, that one. Thing, yeah. you know, and. Uh, I was using the, the 7, the NEX 7, the guys using the Alphas and, and looking up my images and I could do exactly what they were doing with the DSLR on my, on my NEX 7. Yeah. And it, was, it was amazing. But the one big thing about the NEX is when they first came out was the menu. It was designed by a computer company or a television company for computer guys using cameras. Like the photographers. Exactly. Like and, and that was their problem. Now, Sony said to us at that time, and this is going back, well, when the, seven, the NEX7 came out, which I think was, what, three, four years ago? They said then, a guy by the name of Paul Denk, who's no longer with uh, uh, Sony's with another firm now, but he said, we are determined to be the number one camera manufacturer in the world. And I thought at the time, with being a Nikon user, I thought, you've got a pretty damn long way to go to catch up. But I think they're very, very close to being the number one camera because they are prepared to push the boundary. They're prepared to give things a try. Um, they'll throw money at it, so to speak. But I'm not so sure about the Sony A7. I think they've made yeah. a big mistake with the A7S uh, by reducing the, the pixel and going for this video mode. And there are new uh, products coming on board, the GH4, with the 4K video, uh, there are other cameras now going 4K video as well. Where I'm moving into a direction now, where I can honestly see, here's my prediction: you will see sports photographers using a 4K video camera and picking the in individual image as they want, rather than using your big DSLR cameras. But I'm not so sure about the Sony A7 having seen it for the first time in use. That is, uh, yesterday. Hmm. It's, uh, I, I, it, very clunky. To me, it comes down to the size of the lenses. Yes. If you make the you make the sensor big, that means the aperture's got to be big. If the aperture's yeah. got to be big, you know, if the image circle's got to be big, that means the aperture's got to be big. If the aperture's got to be big, then the lens is going to be big. Yeah. And it's just going in the wrong direction. We we should, the the whole point of of going micro four thirds was to, to reduce the size. Yeah. Reduce the weight. Uh -huh. um, if you go, you, you, what you end up doing by going for a uh, one of the A sevens is you say, oh, I want a small, small camera, and then I'm going to put this massive, great big lens on it that's, that has, for purely physics reasons, got to be reasonably large. Oh. Um, and another thing you mentioned about Trey, just in passing, um, Trey Ratcliffe now uses a lot of uh, Leica lenses. He does, and that's a good way to go on the, on the ASO. Because they're, they're, they're smaller. And yeah. then I've also noticed, the in actual fact, he's using, is it the E-series lenses of, of the Sony? Which, in actual fact, are set for the one and a half crop, but mm -hmm. he's prepared to lose that um, that sort of uh, vignetting on the on the edge, mm. meaning he's going to crop in just a little bit to to rid the the vignette or enhance the uh, vignette when he's when he's doing his editing process. Yeah, I, I mean he he's he has his own approach. Um, sure. <clears throat> I think it would be it would be a foolish thing to do to try and. Go for something just because Trey does. I mean, oh, what Trey does is not yeah. something that any of us can emulate. No. It comes back to what we were saying before. Trey, Trey gives away everything about how he does what he does. Mm -hmm. And we still, none of us get pictures that look like Trey's. And it's because Trey knows what he's after. Yeah, exactly. And he's shooting for that. Um, and so, you know, the equipment he uses, it's his particular style of shooting. Um, all you can say from the fact that Trey uses it is that it is good enough for a professional, fantastic quality photographer to use. Mm -hmm. but it may not, it may or may not suit you as you, as you, you know, your own particular interests. Um, and I, I just wanted something lighter and smaller, and it doesn't suit yeah. me. I, 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 it just seems to me like a bizarre way to go to, to make a take a mirrorless camera and then force it to have big lenses. And yeah. I, I think actually the fact that that Trey is not using the Sony lenses bears out exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, the argument could be said that Sony are not producing those those lenses, but um, you, you know, if you look at what what he's using, uh, he's, well, he's using quality glass. Let's let's not put any punches. You know, <laughs> but but it's not because they're quality glass that he's using them. No, 
it's it, 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 smaller. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I'm putting words in his mouth. That's not. That's not fair. But I. I, I I just noticed that that uh, that the people that that use these things a lot do tend to invest in, you know, yeah. in in Leica lenses and things because they are smaller. Yeah. Yeah, they get the adapter and they put the uh, put the other lenses on. It's very true. Trey, Trey can speak for himself. Get him on the show. Of course he can. Yeah, get him on the show. <laughs> 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 so that that's a very good segue, as they say in the states, the Arcanum. Mm. Um, the Arcanum. Absolutely. I'm, as everyone you knows. You say Arcanum, I say Arcanum. Arcanum, Arcanum. <laughs> I'm, I'm an I've yet, yet to have this out with anyone from the Arcanum. <laughs> I'm an apprentice with uh, Valerie Jardin in the street cohort. Um, one of the first, in actual fact, cohorts that were set up. Uh, we started off as the beta group. Oh, wow. Uh, we we, were, were, right real, early. we wow. were really uh, big testing, testing ground. Which is great fun. I've learned so much from this. I can let's let's hear. I know you've done a presentation for it, uh, which mm. I've seen obviously in the Grand Library. Let, let's hear what what you're looking forward to with regards to the Arcanum jump. You know, um, it's funny. My, pro my my feelings about the Arcanum sort of sort of drifted when I first when I first read about it. My first thought was, it sounds like a pyramid scheme. It's it's not a pyramid scheme at all. No, but it, there is a danger that it gets look that it looks that way. Um, yeah. And then I thought, um, I wasn't sure about the about the small groups thing, um, and I particularly I'm a little uncomfortable with the concept of masters and apprentices because uh, I've, you've probably gathered from the way I've spoken. I don't like to think of myself. As in any way superior, it's, I, I treat everybody like an equal. I like to try and make sure that everybody is working in a collegiate sort of way, um, because you know I, I'm I'm not that great. Um, I'm a reasonable talker, but I'm not an amazing photographer. Um, and I would like to um, to try and sort of put everybody on a level so that we all learn from each other. And then I suddenly realised the revelation came to me after after I was thinking about this. You know, I didn't like the idea of being called a master. Because a master felt like a superior, uh, but then I suddenly realised. But hang on a minute, the way I feel about wanting everyone to learn from each other and share all that information—that's exactly what the Arcanum is about. That is how that whole—that's what makes the the cohort idea work. Yeah. Um, and so I, the more I thought about it, the more I realised actually this is this is my ideal way of teaching because my my favourite way to teach is one to one. My yeah. least favorite way to teach is to record a video tutorial and then post it later, which is ironically what I've been doing. Mm. Uh, and the more I've got, the more opportunities I've had to to teach people in person or through webinars or you know through email and that sort of thing, the the more I have enjoyed the in the interaction with an individual, so that I can learn from them what they what they're trying to achieve. Mm. Talk to them about why did you do it this way? What did you have in mind? And yeah. quite often they'll say something and and I'll go, oh right, okay, I see what I see why this looks the way it does now. Yeah. So you know, and then you can sort of say, well, okay, you were trying to achieve this. Maybe you needed to do that. Uh, you know, maybe you needed to stand there or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you can't get that direct help without understanding from somebody what they were trying to achieve and what was in their mind at the time. So the ability to talk one to one with somebody, the ability to work as a group that gets to know each other, that is extremely exciting. That's what I'm most excited about. Yeah. I can't. If I could just interject there and say, mm. you, you, you've hit the nail on on the head, so to speak, because that is exactly what I get from my cohort. Uh, there's 23, 25 of us in in the cohort for street photography with Valerie. Um, her input on our images is superb. Uh, she's a professional street photographer. She has workshops throughout the world. Um, uh, and to have a one-to-one -one session with her for, let's say, 30 minutes for her talking about my photography is is second to none. But then what in actual fact helps me as much is hearing what my fellow core members say about my work. Yes, you're going too far with this, Paul. Pull that back. Did you see this guy in the background? Did you see that on there? And so on and so on and so forth. And it is so much uh, so intuitive, uh, intuitive. I can't say the word. Uh, uh, the way that you learn from the people that are also learning from you, mm. it's a two-way thing. Um, it's, a, it's a personal thing. We're, we're human beings. We are set up to, yeah. to converse and work in groups, and it just plays to the to our humanity. Exactly right. Way. Yeah. 
It is. It is. Uh, I agree with exactly what your 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 original thoughts were about uh, about the way the arcana is being set up and your concerns. I think you're right to think that way. Um, I certainly haven't experienced anything of that nature, quite honest with you, as, as things have developed. It, it, it's not. It doesn't work that way at all. It just no, it doesn't. The terminology is the issue, not not it, the, the ethos. Actually, is is perfect. Yes. Everybody behaves like equals and there are some absolutely amazing people yeah. as, as masters in the arcane. I mean yeah, a, they are. a whole ton of my personal heroes yeah. are, are masters in the arcane and I and I pop into the um, there's a there's a masters there's a masters community where uh -huh. you can ask for help. Yeah. And I pop in there and I look at the list of people that are posting and I'm like oh, I, know. I can't right. believe I'm in the community with these lot. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. So, it's interesting yeah. enough, actually, because when one of the uh, levels which we had to do was to pick three uh, three videos, three critiques which which uh, had taken place. Mm. Uh, one I took with Doug um, with Doug Hyde, um, and then there's another one with a, a, a lady called Jessica Lang, who was in actual fact talking to a guy by the name of Martin Higgs. I was totally blown away by the Apprentice's work, Martin Higgs. Unbelievable! I had to get him on my show. I called him up and said, "Would you come right. on the show? Because your work, you need a voice. You need to get out there." And and uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping the show has helped him because wonderful it's a, a glamour uh, photography, makeup, and uh, hairstyling photographer, um, which um, his work was just amazing. And this is what you what you see and what you learn by. When you are in a situation where you can go and look at other critique sessions which are going on with in within other cohorts, which is uh, fantastic. Actual fact, in two or three weeks' time, I'm interviewing a guy from my cohort who's just completed his 100 Portraits of Strangers project. Oh, wonderful! So uh, I'm oh, looking forward to that. That guy's Mark Rearson, and uh, it's going to be a Saturday show because Mark lives in Calgary. And uh, we've, although I've although I've spoken to people on the other side of the states, Mark uh, will probably be getting home too late from work, so we're going to do it on a Saturday that time. But so I'm looking forward to that. You can get up really early one morning. Yeah, I'll, have to, I'll, I'll get up. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon, Mark. No, I mean good morning. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. But now the Arcanum is really something which is, uh, if you get the opportunity to be part of, it, it's uh, it, it's a fantastic way. To learn about photography, far better than being a member of a camera club. Well, or, as we mentioned that, before, it's, it's night and day. It's night and day. Yeah. And as I say, despite all my fears about the terminology, the yeah. ethos when I get in there, when I go into that masters community, um, yeah. there is no pride. There is no superiority. Everybody yeah. is is an absolute delight, and yeah. all the people I've met behave in a way like exactly like I would like. Everybody behaves like equals. Everyone treats everyone's work with respect. Uh -huh. And and, um, and, and it, it, it's just a, a, a nurturing environment. It is a, it is a genuinely interested, uh, positive, you know, uh, uh, kind environment. Yeah, it's lovely. not like the, the sort of, the, the, it can be a little bit competitive and backbitey in, in a camera club. Yeah. It's not like that at all. Uh, yeah. and that, that will be when I make my cohort, which um, I've, I've started the invites today, um, I, that, that is exactly what I'm going to try and, and, and encourage is, is um, a group of people that are able to discuss each other's work you know, in a genuine way that doesn't just say nice shot. But but give some thoughts and give some yeah. critiques. But but you know sometimes you might say well, I, I really like this but I don't like that element of it or you know I wish it just stood a bit to the right or something like that. Yeah. It's possible to say those things in kind ways. Yeah, no, it, 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 you're quite right. Sometimes, uh, funny enough, I was talking to Valer about this a couple of days ago. Sometimes you there you can as a when you're giving critique, I think you can go a little bit over over the top and you you're consistently looking for something. Whereas in the end, really, is a great shot. Yeah. That's all that needs to be said. That's sometimes. But yeah, but but in that situation, if you can start saying why it's a great shot. Yeah, exactly right. No, I agree. You're not, you're not educating the person. The person no. who took it knows it's a great shot because for those reasons already. But by writing it down, it goes into your own brain. And I, exactly. I've said this many times, and I'll keep saying it. You will learn way more by giving critique than by receiving it because yep. the process of being able to verbalize what you like and don't like educates you about what you like and don't like and that is what gives you your personal style yeah that is how you discover your personal style by realizing 
and actually being able to say out loud, I like it when somebody does shadow the field, or I like it when somebody uses lots of negative space, or I like it when somebody uses a creative color. You know, those are the things when you can start actually verbalizing what you like, yeah. then you start using it in your own photography. Yeah, very, very good points. Very wise words there. John, what's, what's the future plans for you and the photo walkthrough, apart from the Arcana, which is obviously going to be mm. quite an exciting time for you, and I, dare I say it's probably going to take up quite a bit of your time. <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in such a good way. I love critiquing stuff. I, love, I, I'm, I can't wait. Well, one of the things that, that the... Um, the induction process um, we've been through has said, and that, that you know, all the all the masters that we've spoken to have already been doing it. Have been said, oh, you're setting up your you're setting up your uh, your cohort. Be ready for some critique sessions. There's going to be a whole bunch of them all at once. Yeah, exactly. You right. know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> I can't wait because because that 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 is where you discover who somebody is. Who as a photographer, that discover, you discover what they love and what they do. Yeah. That that is that is going to be a very exciting time for me. I think one of the things which happened when we first started off was I think that everyone it was just a sort of a, a like an avalanche is the best way I can describe it, like <laughs> yeah. a tsunami of, of work that was just thrown onto the onto the site. And I did I, I, it was fantastic right. because everyone said and then you get the, the guys, dare I use the term the geeks were coming and saying, Oh, what we should do is have this and what we should do is have that and I'm going, No, just just keep it all together. If there's two hundred images up there I don't really care. But it slowly, but slowly, people slow down and they get into their pace and their their way of learning, and it and it goes on. But I remember Trey Ratcliffe joined us on a hangout because we were talking about it, and he just popped in because he does this because he does watch. Yeah. If he, sees, if he sees anyone from the the Arcanum is having a hangout, he boom. Hi guys, I thought I'd join you. How are you finding things? And of course, the master of masters. It's like. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's like the Jedi Knight has like joined Yoda. Us. Yeah. yeah, Yoda, exactly. But he, he said that, amazing. Uh, he, I can't believe he manages to find as much time as he does. Well, exactly. <laughs> but he, he was asking his question. We were saying, look, Trey, there's just one of these guys. There's just too much work going in. Then he says, don't worry. This is all going to slow down. And it has. This has all happened, happened before. This <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so anyway, let's, let's get back to John Arnold. What's your feeling <laughs> outside of the Arcanum? So we were talking about the future. Um, the uh, well, I, I should mention I've just relaunched the photo walkthrough website. I'm sort of trying to refresh things a little bit. Um, yeah. There's a lot of old tutorials on there. I've, as I say, I've got over two hundred video tutorials on there, um, and there, there's so a lot of the tutorials. I've got twenty eight tutorials that are broken into chapters and some of them are, are getting a little aged now and some of them are still very contemporary I would like to produce um, I'd like to get back into producing a lot more regular work I'd like to start producing a few things that are that frankly will pro provide me with a, a passive income stream I'd like to make some stuff to sell because um, at the moment I give everything away for free everything on the site there there's, there's literally nothing you can buy uh -huh. uh, because I'm an idiot and I give it all away for free. Um, so at some point, I would like to make something. Maybe I'm thinking about an ebook, and I'm thinking about. Um, uh, I've been doing webinars for Mac Fun. Have you, I don't know. Are you a Mac guy or a PC guy? I'm Mac. Maybe You're Mac. Mac guy, right? So have you, have you tried um, Intensify or Tonality yet? No, I haven't. No. Worth a try. There's free trial, free, free trials. I'm not here to, to promote Mac Fun, but I do do webinars for them because I love the products. And um, so I've been thinking maybe about doing ebooks on those products. Um, so there's, there's two or three things I'd like to do, but as much as anything else, more than anything else, I just want to start producing tutorials again because it's it sort of, it's been so difficult to do with the kids and with, with I've got a family business, I, I, I run a printing business and uh, we've had some fairly hard times in, with that business, so it, you know I've, I've needed to focus on that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm really very keen to try and build this back up into into a going concern and produce regular content that is useful to people. Yeah. And I, I think I've got a good approach. I, I've I've simplified the whole thing down to a much much shorter form. And the webinars have helped me a great deal with learning how to prep these things um, and how to present them in a way that is that is uh, short form but still you know usefully educational. And I, I was already doing and, and want to continue doing the thing where I talk about the art of it as much as I do the technique of it. So it's it's really more of the same, but but um, 
doing the photo walkthrough gave me this opportunity to start teaching workshops and classrooms and, and webinars and things. And actually, I love those more than doing the videos. The videos are a means to an end. Those are the videos are what gets my name out there. Um, but but the other stuff is the stuff that I that I will enjoy. Um, and then that's so I'd like to do more of that. I'd like to do more classroom teaching. I'd like to do more uh, the Arcanum type stuff and, and wow. more webinars. And um, yeah, that, that's that's really what that because when I can interact with people, even on a webinar, it's, I have I, I I do these webinars on Go to Meeting, uh, Go to Webinar rather, which is which is the Citrix product they use. And there's the, the group of people watching can't see each other's comments. All they can do is see my screen and hear my voice. So we end up in this conversation where everything that's said to anyone goes through me. Uh, and, you know, we have some regulars that turn up now. And so they ask a question, and I read the question out, and I answer the question. And some other people chime in, and I, and I read out what the other person said back. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's funny, but it, it's the most crude community mechanism possible. And yet, if you are interested enough in people and you encourage them to come out of their skins a bit, even that can turn into... Uh, a community feeling. Yeah, uh, where people feel like they are part of a group, and people are so much happier and much more willing to get involved if you do that. If they feel like they are part of the group of something, mm. then 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 that, you know that collegiate attitude really uh, it, that 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 makes everybody happy and makes people learn faster yeah. and share skills better. I I was um, a great. couple of weeks ago. I went on a workshop with Alex Lambrex. Brex. I don't know whether you know the uh, lifestyle stroke fashion photographer. No, I don't know him. No. Check him out on the website. Um, he's uh, he's truly pushing the barriers. Wonderful. Uh, pushing the boundaries with regards to uh, lifestyle and fashion photography. But anyway, after the after the um, uh, event, we all went out for a meal and we we're having a, a beer. And and someone said, "Wouldn't it be nice if we could talk about how to edit the photos properly?" Now I would had Alex on my show. And he said to me, he said, Paul, could we, could we organize something? So I said, well, of course we could. So what we in actual fact did was we had a private Google Plus Hangout with seven or eight of the guys from, from the 12 that came along. And, of course, then Alex went through the images and talked us through as regards to how or not best way to, to do editing for a fashion shoot as it was and also just to get across his, his ideas of fashion. You know, they, this is where... The Google Plus Hangout is really, well, certainly up my uh, my opportunity with regards to this show. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it was a it was a good way to end a, a, a workshop, which took place about a week and a half after the the workshop had uh, had uh, taken place. It comes back to what we were saying earlier. You, now you've got the whole cycle. Yeah. You've got the setup. You've got visualizing the shot. You've got taking the shot. You've got him. Yeah. You got then the post-processing of it and the presentation of it and the selection of images, which is as important as any other part. You know, uh -huh. that bit where you go through and decide what you're going to post. Yeah, that, that bit's key. You know, and people exactly. forget that. And actually, you, you see it a lot in uh, in people that are relatively new to photography. They post everything. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like everything that had any merit at all uh, yes. gets posted. Um, and that is part of what makes you know that 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 lets you down. You, you yeah. the portfolio review is as much about what's not there as what is. Yeah, D don't necessarily post the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's no, <laughs> stay clear of that. Post only the good stuff. Only the good and stuff. Once again, I'm undermining myself because you shared my photographs earlier, and there were two or three there that I said don't like that one. <laughs> well, like, 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 that's, that's your own personal opinion. We all have our own yeah. opinions about images, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Okay, right, we come to the point of the show where it's your favourite photographer. Mm. Um, if you'd like to... It changes, it changes. Yeah. Um, if you'd asked me this two or three years ago, I would have said um, a lady that runs a website called A Walk Through Durham Township, and I think her name is Kathleen Connolly or something. Right, I'm not familiar with that name, but carry on. She's a, just a wonderful uh, landscape photographer, she's got a an eye for a scene that gives you a sense of the place. And it was a very, very simple site. She lives in this beautiful place. Um, I mean, she makes it look beautiful. You know, we, I, I live in the northwest of England. I live in a beautiful place. But I don't have, I don't, I don't manage to make where I live look as beautiful as she makes where she looks, where she lives. And we all have this thing where we, we, um, we, we desperately want to go to where somebody we know lives because where they live is oh, damn beautiful. Exactly right. You know, and if only I could go there with a the camera, I'd take wonderful pictures. Yeah. But it never works out that way, and we all forget that where we live is beautiful too. 
I mean, okay, there are places that aren't beautiful, but none of us live far away from somewhere that is intrinsically beautiful. Mm. Um, and uh, so I have this ongoing project where I, I would like to try and take more pictures of where I live and make it look the way I see it. And it doesn't, I don't want it to look like the Durham Township pictures. They were wonderful and evocative of that place. But uh, but I want to take pictures that are wonderful and evocative of my place. So that so that that sort of inspired me a lot, and that that led me along my creative approach for a long way. But more recently, um, as I got more interested in uh, model photography and and um, you know portraiture, and and also one of the things that I've worked very hard on is trying to be friendly enough and open enough with people that I can go up to people I don't know and talk to them, mm -hmm. which is not something that I'm naturally predisposed to do. It is a mode I can turn on. It is something that I am willi willing to risk and able to, to, to sort of be friendly and approachable that way. But I'm actually an introvert. I'm not like that in, in myself. If, if you, you know, once I've done that for a couple of hours in a workshop, I need to go and shut myself in a room and be alone for an hour just to recharge because I, I, it, it's, a, it's a mode I can be in. But it's not it's not in naturally me. So that was hard. And you're a street photographer, you'll know mm -hmm. how hard it can be when you're the guy stood on the street with a camera and you're taking pictures of people that you don't know. Yeah. It's difficult not to be threatening. How do you how do you go about be, being that guy and not being threatening? Well, a lot of, a lot of the shots that I'm taking, to be honest, I'm 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 keeping a distance. That's that's the first thing. But just recently um, I am now making more contact and speaking to people more, and I am making more street portraits. But it's not really the way that I want to go. I want to be more of a candid type shot. So, yes, I am grabbing shots, so to speak. Um, I've had a couple of instances where people have come up to me and say, hey, you take a photograph of me, and I've just gone through the menu and said, no, look, you can see it's not there, and it hasn't been. So... Um, there are different techniques I've used, like uh, Zach Harris's favourite one is to look at a building behind and imagine you're just looking at the camera and you just take the shot. Um, those sort of cheats that you sometimes do, but I, I, I've probably had over the last five outings, two, maybe three people that come up to me and say, don't take my photograph, please. And well, that, that's I'm fine. Yeah, of course, you just delete it. No problem, no problem. Yeah, not a problem. I think I think the key to that is um, is just being approachable and honest. Uh, yes. I think honest more than anything else. If somebody comes up to you and looks uncomfortable, you can see right away that they're that they're uncomfortable. You know, oh. it's easy to put a, put somebody at their ease, smile, oh. and say, you know, hi, yeah. I'm I'm just taking pictures for for a bit of fun. It's I do this for fun. Yeah. If you'd rather I didn't take your picture, it's no problem. I won't take your picture. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the end of the. You know, all the any any tension is diffused. And if exactly. you take a picture, you can show them the picture. And if you say, "Would you rather I deleted it?" Fine, gone. Yeah. No, no picture is worth upsetting somebody. It's interesting actually you say that because it happened uh, this this last Wednesday. I was walking along South Bank, and this this fellow walked past with two ladies who had cameras. Right. And I just passed him, and I said, "Oh, he, he was." Lovely old fellow, big beard, and glasses, and, and flat cap. I said, oh, could I take your photograph? And, and he went, uh, uh, and she said, no, he hasn't got time for that. And she started pushing around and said, hey, come on, you're taking photographs as well. And they, everyone started to laugh. And he said, yeah, of course you can take my photograph. Perfect. But please don't, put it, please don't put it on Flickr, he said. So I said, it's not going on Flickr, don't worry. <laughs> I've, got they went, they Google they, I've got 65 they, million they, viewers. They, 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 they wanted to know what I was doing it for, and I'm, I am doing this 100 Portrait, portraits of strangers myself. Uh -huh. So uh, I said it's going to a project linked to the Arcanum, blah de blah de blah. And, and he's oh yeah fine, and he was fine by it. I gave him my business card as well, which I've got some cards made up, which I think is a good little tip to use. Right. Yeah, I I agree, and I try and have them with me, but I always forget. Yeah. <laughs> but I just think more than anything else, being honest with people and just. Yes. You know, so anyway, so I'm glad you mentioned Zacharias because he's another one of the people yeah. that greatly, greatly uh, inspired me. Um, and I, you know, he's his his approach is is partly to do with the way he looks. Yeah, um, he is an interesting character, and being an interesting character like that is not something that's available to all of us. Um, 
so I, I tend to major more on being nice rather than being interesting. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so Zacharias is, 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 is a big, big influence. But the final one that I'd like to mention is uh, Jamie Ibarra. Mm -hmm. who, um, he's a fascinating fellow. Uh, he uh, has synesthesia, which is uh, it's it's a sort of a a, a brain. I don't want to use con the word condition because I think it's actually kind of a gift. Uh, but he, your senses get mixed up, and sometimes you can smell a sound or you can taste a color, or you know. So the, the things that shouldn't go together do. Mm -hmm. um, and he has uh, this thing where color. Uh, sort of uh, it affects him very very strongly, and as a result, his taste in color is amazing. Um, his his the, the, just the color in his images. I mean, he's he, he's wonderful at composing and posing, and and obviously he's he's great with dealing people with people as well. And that is a really important skill: the ability to deal with somebody and be non-threatening and and approachable when you're dealing with people on the street or when you're dealing with a model in a in a in a studio shoot. Mm -hmm. it's the same skill. Um, and obviously he's good at all of that. But the thing that I admire him for is um, his his imagination and his color. Um, and I, I, if you've only got to look at my work to see that uh, that that is that has greatly affected my work. Um, I just just trying to understand um, what it is that that works well together and what it is that makes a photograph congeal and become a, a consistent piece. Yeah. We, you know, you look at the world around us and we take a photograph with with our camera and there's always a bunch of pieces in the picture that 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 just they don't go together. They clash and they and, and they distract. Um, and unless you can have total control over every, every environment, you can't remove those things without doing something to try and um, reduce and simplify. And that, that might be composing it down. It might mean cropping in. It might mean getting closer. It might mean working with light and shadow, and maybe changing the light around a little bit. Um, but it can often mean color, and, and you can bring a photograph together as a, as a as a piece that looks like a finished whole by bringing the colors into a palette that works well together. Right. I, do, I do a webinar on this actually, um, just on. Uh, on color theory and how color works in photographs, and I finish up with pointing at people at um, uh, at adobecooler.com. It's K-U-L-E-R, um, cooler.adobe.com, and I think they've they've renamed it now something else. But if you you can still go to that that URL, so K-U-L-E-R.adobe.com, there is a there's a feature in there that lets you upload a photograph, and it shows you the colors that are the predominant colors in the photograph, and it allows you to sort of analyze the color palette of a picture in a way that starts to educate you about you know well look all these colors that, that you've got a photograph where all the colors were basically in the same direction on the color wheel and and these are sort of analogous colors um, so that that it, again go back to 500pix.com pick any picture that appeals to you that is in color upload it to adobecooler.com cooler.adobe.com sorry mm -hmm. look at what colors are in it and see for yourself why these pictures work, and it, it's just that. that so, so jamiebarra.com. Uh, is it, no, it's abarrafoto.com. I b a double r a photo.com. Um, and just dig through some of his work, and you'll see what I mean. I'll put those uh, put those Bye. links on the thing. I think I've heard of this Adobe Cooler. I remember if you've heard of Serge Remily, uh, mm. the uh, the French editor. Uh, he does a similar type pod podcast to yourself. Um, and I think I've seen him uh, make a reference to this uh, this cooler um, site. Yeah, it has some limitations, but it's I think fundamentally just the ability to sort of see yeah the palette of colours that came out of the image and reduce it just to the colours. Yeah, is educational. I think he used it on the basis of editing a particular photograph to give it that Hollywood st uh, style. Yeah, it's a color grading thing. I mean, exactly. when you when you start messing with the colors of a photograph or a video, it tends to be called grading, and it's about moving the colors onto a palette. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because the world isn't on a palette, you know, no. and that's what um, cross processing did so well. You know, the the phase of of cross processing different uh, yeah. color films in in the wrong chemicals, it moved images onto a onto a color palette. Mm. And that's what gave them that that look. And of course, yeah. that that idea has developed so much with quitting, with digital photography. Exactly right, John. It's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me. This has uh, been a pleasure. Thank you. No, it's uh, it's, it's lovely. Um, I might have a little chat with him afterwards, actually. But I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, folks, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, yep, it's the end of the show, and uh, if you're going out shooting this weekend, leave your camera bag at home. All the best, you guys. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>